Hi, my name is Katina Michael, and today I'll be introducing to you the International Symposium on Technology and Society 2020. This symposium by the IEEE SSIT has been going since 1972 on a variety of themes on the social implications of technology. This year's conference is dedicated to the theme of public interest technology and public interest technology serves to address social needs and challenges in society. People working in this space ask communities what their needs are first without presuming that they know what's best for them and generally use a participatory approach to innovation with values in mind and cultural awareness. Public interest technologies pertain to technologies that might leverage open source software for collaboration, for example, or open data initiatives to overcome societal challenges. But it's all about justice. This idea of environmental justice, social justice, justice for children and the elderly and those living with disability. It's my pleasure today to introduce to you the program chair of this year's ISTAS 20, Dr. Roba Abbas from the School of Management and Marketing in the Faculty of Business and Law at the University of Wollongong. Thank you, Katina. Thank you for that introduction and welcome everyone to this keynote presentation to be delivered by Ms. Jumana Abu Ghazele from Pivot for Humanity, which was prepared for ISTAS 20, as Katina mentioned. My name is Robert Abbas from the University of Wollongong and I'm delighted to be here today with Professor Michael and Ms. Abu Ghazele to deliver this talk and with our speaker today. Um, but before I do, I just wanted to briefly address the way in which this session will be structured. So the format of this recorded session is such that we'll be hearing from our keynote speaker shortly. And this will be followed by um, a Q&A session in which we will engage with our speaker um, on questions stemming from her presentation. The recording will then be broadcast live at ISTAS 20 with an accompanying live discussion facilitated by a member of our team in which you may engage with our speaker. Please prepare your questions as you hear this presentation and we look forward to hearing from you. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Ms. Jumana Abu Ghazeli, our keynote speaker. Jumana is the president of Pivot for Humanity, the organization founded in 2018 to professionalize the extractive data-driven social tech industry and foster a responsible, ethical and accountable internet. Pivot's goal is to compel an industry in crisis to adopt universal standards norms and values that would pivot or reorient the industry towards its original mission, which is serving humanity. In 2014, Jumana founded and launched Zany, an app designed to help employers shrink the virtual distance and create a thriving and emotionally engaging digital workforce. Zany helps companies build stronger distributed teams by facilitating conversations that build interpersonal trust between remote members and lead to innovative, productive and fulfilling work. Jumana's first career was in marketing and brand strategy and communications, where she spent over 20 years developing strategies for organizations such as American Express, Yahoo, Coca-Cola, Bank of America and more. Jumana earned her MBA from Harvard Business School and a degree in literature and philosophy from Claremont McKenna College. Welcome, Jumana. We're delighted to have you here today, and thank you for accepting our invitation to speak as a pioneer at ISTAS 20. Thank you for having me. Let me just share my screen here. Can you see my screen? Yep, that's fine. Thank you, Jumana. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, Katina and Dr. Abbas, it always, it's always a pleasure to exchange ideas with you. Today, I wanna to talk to you about magic. Um, it's power and promise, it's pitfalls and perils. Science fiction writer, Arthur C. Clarke famously said that any technology advanced enough is indistinguishable from magic. So I wanna start where the magic all began, bear with me. When I say cyberspace, what comes to mind? If you Google cyberspace today, what will show up as news is almost exclusively stories about the threat of cyber warfare. But that happened gradually. For me, when I hear cyberspace, I go back to the 90s. The movies from the time include classics like The Matrix, Existenz, Hackers, and The Lawnmower Man. That one's admittedly not as much of a classic, but 
we'll let it slide. The point is, back when cyberspace was still a commonly used everyday term, it was the 90s. And there's something that all of those movies have in common. The idea of cyberspace as a utopian world of mind, a literal alternative to reality in which one could become enveloped, hooked in, severed from the physical realm altogether. This was a notion that some of the most prominent thinkers of the time actively advocated for as a real and very good thing. Almost 25 years ago, John Perry Barlow, founder of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, published his Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace. Here's how it began. Governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come from cyberspace, the new home of mind. So if cyberspace was going to be romanticized as the home of the mind, what was the weary realm of flesh and steel of people and things to be known as? In other words, if I choose to live in cyberspace and want to defend it as a place to spend my time away from the physical world around me, what do I call that messier natural world out there? The message boards had an answer. Users started circulating an alternate term for real life that some have claimed Barlow himself coined and the term started spreading as a derogatory descriptor of all that was not on the internet. That term was meat space. Nature, with all the seasons and temperatures and plants and creepy crawlies, that's meat space. Going to party, meat space. Holding a newborn baby, classic meat space. Why am I talking so much about meat space, a proto memetic artifact of 90s message board culture here today in 2020? Because almost 30 years later, COVID-19 has delivered the worst curse possible on those who derided the real world as meat space. They got their wish granted. In much of the world and virtually all of the United States, meat space has been canceled. This is not an exaggeration. Has anyone been to any good concerts lately? Weren't running into the pit? Rubbed shoulders with people who loved the same bands you do? I'm guessing not. How about going out to a sports stadium to catch the big games in a mega meat space? Or catching a movie in a cozier meat space? Maybe a big family wedding, a joyful occasion to gather in meat space. Or have you just held a close friend tightly for a moment? Someone you don't see in person that often, who's having a hard time, hugged them for a while. If you're in the United States, almost certainly not. Because what all of those activities have in common is that they happen in meat space. And today, so many of the, these community building activities are high to extremely high risk activities to transmit COVID-19. We've all suffered a certain level of persistent low level emotional trauma for at least six months now, it's all the more amplified if you've lost a job or a loved one or risk infection every day to go to your job. And part of the trauma is that one key avenue to discharge the trauma itself has been taken off the table, building community in person in meat space. Think about how many holiday gatherings like Thanksgiving here in the United States simply won't happen in a few weeks in a, rec in a recognizable way. And as if we weren't barreling in this direction fast enough, thanks to COVID-19, virtually all of our public spaces, our common spaces are online spaces. Meat space has been canceled. All that is left is cyberspace. How many Zoom calls have you been on this year? Is it 50, 100, 200? Almost certainly dramatically more than 2019, which means more literally than ever before, we're creating a shared neighborhood and actively shaping society whenever we create social technology for the general public. As Jaron Lanier once said, it is impossible to work in information technology without also engaging in social engineering. That is to say, without actively reshaping society. Where I'm speaking in the United States with our economy and public spaces held hostage to COVID-19 for at least a while to come, information technology is arguably the only social engineering game in town. It's as if most of the places we, most of the places we'd normally look to build, to build, shape, improve, fix, and change society are stuck in a kind of cryogenic sleep, waiting to be woken up when COVID-19 is safely behind us. Meanwhile, 
the people creating our online sphere, our cyberspace, are working overtime. And that terrifies me. Because the people with that all access pass, the people with carte blanche, disproportionately economically comfortable white men in the global north, aren't just hard at work on building out cyberspace. Because safe access to public physical space is significantly compromised, anyone building cyber, cyberspace might as well be creating the world we physically inhabit, a sort of meat space 2.0. Our schools, our houses of worship, and all our community making, all the stuff most of us relegated to the physical realm by default. The people who control cyberspace are now shaping how we function as a society, how we learn, how we interact, how we celebrate, how we teach, how we work, how we share, how we develop, how we grow, how we commune, how we empathize or not. And yet, these vanguards of cyberspace are less accountable to the public interest than the people con who controlled meat space before it was canceled by a large margin. And they're under no obligation to adhere to any norms, any public norms outside of what existing laws lets them get away with. This is not normal. This is not the way we typically think about people who build common infrastructure in the public interest, which is really what we're talking about here. Take for example, a bridge. Think about how many qualifications go into building a single bridge. As any municipal planner can tell you, there are lots of considerations when you build any kind of public space or public structure. Zoning laws, environmental impact statements, questions of who's funding which part, safety regulations, and at every step of the way, the people planning and building your public spaces need to be accredited professionals. Even in small rural towns, the people building bridges and roads are qualified in some way, which is to say they have qualifications. There are usually consequences, professional and legal, for claiming you know how to build a bridge and then having it collapse and injure or worse kill people. That's because virtually every profession involved in public infrastructure is in fact a profession. Why does that matter? Because professionals profess their commitment to practicing their craft in the public interest. The concept of a profession comes from the act of professing, of making a vow or taking an oath and declaring publicly a commitment to practicing a craft for the benefit of society up to the standards its, its practitioners collectively set for the profession. A profession is built on four pillars. First, professions are unified. Their members united around a shared vision for the industry, a unifying purpose expressed as an oath or manifesto underpinned by a code of ethics worthy of the public's trust. Second, this shared purpose must be codified into a universal set of practical enforceable standards that guide all practitioners what to do, what not to do, what's okay, what's not okay. Think here of something like the IEEE Code of Ethics, which states explicitly the obligations that member professionals must commit to and practice by. Third is certification. Professionals must be certified, meaning they must be educated and trained in accordance with the codified standards of the profession. This is what makes them qualified to engage in building societal infrastructure. And fourth, application which serves to protect the public interest by enforcing standards and imposing disciplinary action on bad actors. Because all of those values and norms and standards don't mean anything. They don't matter if they're not enforced. In the example of the bridge, professionals includes everyone from the municipal planner overseeing the city center, to the lawyers reviewing the documentation, to the architects and civil engineers making the blueprints, to the contractors overseeing the construction itself, to the demolitionists ensuring it's safely destroyed should that become necessary at the end of its lifespan. Members of the various professions I mentioned have all had to profess to make a vow to practice their craft responsibly. All are guided by clear standards and norms. All are certified to practice their craft in accordance with those standards and all are subject to disciplinary action if they do not abide by those standards. In the entire circle of life project, of the project, professionals are involved at every step. This is so obvious to us that it can feel almost non sequitur to point out. That's the point. We take as a granted fact of life that we don't have to worry too much about a bridge collapsing under us. How would we react if our construction crews just decided to wing it with the creation of our literal neighborhoods, traffic signs, bridges? We'd respond with outrage, of course, and try to find out who had to be fired and likely lose their license at best or be imprisoned at worst. 
Engineers can't freestyle bridge planning without ceasing to be engineers. Surgeons can't skip classes on proper operating room disinfection and then stay doctors when their patients keep dying. But the people who are literally building the data-driven world we live in right now have no such constraints or guardrails. At this moment, our world turns on the private decisions of a select few unelected programmers who craft algorithms that in turn are crafting human society. Their choices, assumptions, and mistakes are forming the digital building blocks of our global society from their ivory towers in Silicon Valley for better and for worse. And while the platforms may be digital, the experiences and their consequences are very real. Ordering a pizza, selling a couch, sharing photos, getting a job, finding a doctor, falling in love, supporting a cause, spreading a lie, bullying a child, stalking a woman, starting a revolution, orchestrating a genocide. Everything from the mundane, to the joyful, to the nefarious, to the tragic, to the inhumane takes place on the internet, with meat space limited to only the most liminal role. Meanwhile, it is a fact of life that every click, every mouse movement, every view, every sign up, and every statement is recorded somewhere for use by someone for something, also that big tech can monetize our very existence, even as they experiment with our mental health, induce addiction, discriminate against the vulnerable, and endanger our democracy. Right now, it is a fact of life that the single most important public spaces in the world are, are being overseen by amateurs. They are improvising all the time, every day, with every facet of our lives, they are improvising. We wouldn't accept a bridge being improvised. We shouldn't accept it when so much more than a single bridge is at stake. This is what happens when amateurs build our public spaces. And it is most definitely not in the public interest. And this is why we must professionalize social technology. So tech workers become technologists the same way healers became doctors. That means rethinking from the ground up what makes someone a technologist. For starters, every professional takes an oath, like do no harm, something you think is obvious, but clearly isn't. This has happened before, and we could, if we so choose, make it happen again. Traditionally, a profession emerges when one, an occupation or vocation grows not just in popularity, but in power and influence. Two, the service quality of its practitioners becomes uneven and its impact unwieldy. And three, the occupation faces a crisis of trust that threatens its integrity and challenges its independence. Any of this sound familiar? That's where we are with social technology today. Social tech is big tech, very big tech, and it's unwieldy. Values across big tech are wildly inconsistent and trust in big tech is in free fall. To regain and rebuild trust, social tech needs a new North Star to guide its practitioners. That's what professionalization is really about, reorienting tech workers towards a goal other than growth. So what is professionalization? In the simplest terms, professionalization is a transition. Professionalization is how an industry transitions from a loosely defined and fractious group of people who believe different things, have different priorities and agendas, and throw different tantrums. People whose knowledge base is unstructured and informal, so they move fast and break things. They experiment in the name of innovation, even if that experimentation is harmful and dangerous. People who follow disparate standards and operate under vague rules, which means rules apply to different people at different times and different organizations and people who work with virtually no controls and who don't have to answer to anyone. A profession is a transition from that make it up as you go free for all to a unified, cohesive, qualified and accountable community of practitioners. Call it a rite of passage. It's the moment when leading practitioners take to heart past screw ups, choose to reject wild west abandon and, con and commit to acting like responsible, accountable adults. This is a big systemic solution for a big systemic problem. I understand the impulse to break it up into more digestible, addressable chunks, 
like education, dark patterns or terms and conditions, privacy, antitrust, worker power. And though many of the current initiatives in big tech reform are incredibly well-intentioned, they operate independently and at times competitively, which means their application and impact is scattered, limited, ineffective, and confusing. Tackling any given singular issue, however thoroughly, will not solve what is ultimately a systemic problem. We risk becoming the blind men grasping at an elephant, focusing on, one, on, our, on our one corner and misdiagnosing the entire thing. In some ways, that's the biggest challenge, the siloing of individual ethical questions in tech as separate projects, as if you could solve ethical AI and, and stay antiseptically clear of touching on issues of ethical data, workers' rights, and so on. As a result, the industry remains reactive, with each company individually dealing with the blowback on a scandal by scandal basis. What we need is for the industry to be proactive. That means having a roadmap that clearly out, outlines a broader holistic vision for reform, as opposed to considering these problems as if they were vacuum sealed. I believe professionalization is that roadmap. This won't be the first time humans reclaimed an, an unruly trade that was harming people and tamed it for the sake of humanity. Medicine was once a wild west. Engineering underwent a similar revolution to self-regulate in the 20th century. And here's where they are now. Medicine and engineering are respected, reliable professions with near universal norms and standards. It's important to note that doctors and engineers themselves led that change because they knew they had to protect not only the people who came in contact with the scalpel the surgeon holds or the bridge the engineer built, but also to protect the surgeons and engineers themselves from the constant relentless, demand, relentless demands to outperform, to do more, faster, cheaper. And now it's a social technologist's turn to protect themselves, protect their communities, and protect society at large, just like accountants did before them and financial planners and librarians, veterinarians, nurses, architects, lawyers, teachers, social workers, surveyors, and psychologists. Because any trade that influences massive groups of people also makes it all too easy and tempting for its practitioners to get carried away, take questionable risks, and in doing so, to harm people. But just because professionalization has been done before doesn't mean it will be easy. There's more than a few procedural fixes standing between us and utopia. There's venture capital, an entrenched frontier class that profits from unfettered, unregulated, untested social technology. As Antonio Garcia Martinez, ex-product manager at Facebook notes, if keeping your job depends on pleasing someone else, even if your business card says CEO, you've got a collar around your neck attached to a leash and that leash can be yanked. Far too often, the ones yanking the leash are those who hold the purse strings. When I think of the effect that venture capital has on this tech sector, there's a story that comes to mind, the sorcerer's apprentice. And I think it might be the best allegory to understand the problem facing the social tech sector as a whole right now. For those of you who haven't watched Fantasia lately, the story goes like this. There's a sorcerer and his apprentice. One day, the sorcerer temporarily skips down on a business trip, leaving his inexperienced apprentice to do cleaning work in the sorcerer's absence. Initially, the apprentice begrudgingly does his chores until he realizes there's a quicker, more move fast and break things approach to get out of his responsibilities. He could use the magic he barely understands, has no command over and no real respect for to have the cleaning done for him. Sounds excellent. It takes a second, but pretty soon it quite literally works like a charm. The work is done for him. Automation for the win. The apprentice becomes drunk with power, entering a sort of flow state until something inevitably goes wrong with this powerful magic and the apprentice doesn't have the experience, knowledge or wisdom to stop things from getting out of control. He scrambles to fix things, but it's of no use. Just when it seems things will go irretrievably wrong, the sorcerer thankfully returns and reasserts control over the magic that only he is qualified to properly wield. The apprentice sheepishly admits wrongdoing and is upbraided for it. This is the version Americans generally know. The original version of the sorcerer's apprentice is a 14 stanza poem by that name, whose lines are sometimes invoked in German culture as an allegory for calling forth powerful forces one can't quite control. The lesson is straightforward enough. 
Only those who have mastered powerful forces should be permitted to unleash them upon the world. So it ought to be with technology. The surface level resonance of the fable for this particular age as they intersect with the colossal failures and externalities imposed by Silicon Valley are obvious. Social technology has been harnessed to achieve short-term quarterly ends without any safeguards in place to ensure its safe usage. But here's the part that I don't think is so obvious. Who's the wise sorcerer and who's the apprentice? My vote is that technology workers are the sorcerer. More and more, we're seeing evidence of this. At the big four tech companies, we're seeing workers actively go so far as to put themselves at risk to say, this is not right. We should wield our power more wisely. These tech workers want to practice their craft responsibly. And who are the apprentices? There are several, but the most difficult to defeat, defeat and, and those who pose are, are also those who pose the most obvious obstacle to professionalization, venture capital. Too often, the sorcerers, those who have real mastery and understanding of the magical tools and how to use them, that's the tech workers, have been forced to bow before the VC and manager class. Have you heard of investor story time? Investor story time is not my term. Investor story time is not my term. It comes from the programmer and tech writer, Maciej Tsigowski, who describes it as follows. Investor story time is when someone pays you to tell them how rich they'll get when you finally put ads on their site. Investor story time is a cancer on our industry because to make it work, to keep the edifice of promises from tumbling down, companies have to constantly find ways to make advertising more invasive and more ubiquitous. Investor story time only works if you can argue that advertising in the future is going to be effective and lucrative in, word, in ways it just isn't today. If the investors stop believing this, the money will dry up. Note that he says a cancer on our industry because the industry belongs to the innovators, the technologists, the makers, the sorcerers, and it is at, it is at risk because of the outsized influence of those with the checkbooks. This is the role that venture capital plays, asking the sorcerers to tell them stories of riches to come at the expense of harnessing their power more wisely. This has to stop. The sorcerers must reclaim their craft and protect it from the insatiable appetite of venture capital. Thankfully, we have models in our history to draw upon who called for exactly that and whose work we can continue. Take Margaret Hamilton, the woman most responsible for the software that powered the Apollo 11 moon landing. She coined the term software engineer to convince her bosses to take the crafting of software more seriously and to consider it as a discipline and science to be practiced responsibly, thoughtfully. There she is in 1968, pictured next to the computer code that brought three astronauts to the moon and back. Today, more than five decades later, she's still working on the same overall mission, getting the tech sector to orient itself as engineers, not improvisers, sorcerers, not apprentices. Earlier, I described the physical world as in a cryogenic sleep waiting for the signal that it's time to wake up while the tech world is never stopped. But there's another metaphor for the moment we're in, and it comes from author and activist Arundhati Roy. We're in between worlds. She says, historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. We can use this time to build the real world we enter once we walk through the portal. This is, despite all appearances to the contrary, a time for building. It's time for technologists to empower themselves to fight to protect themselves and to protect the people they are building for from the demands of those whose only agenda can be summarized in one word, more, which is never enough. It's time for the real sorcerers like Margaret Hamilton to return, to reclaim their craft, to step up and stand tall. It's time for technologists to professionalize like their engineering forebearers did before them, 
to profess their commitment to make the one world we have, be it manifest in cyberspace or meat space, a better one for all, rather than a lucrative one for a few. It's time for technologists to take an oath that will remind them that they have the power to say no. No, this is not ready. No, this is not safe. No, we shouldn't move so fast. No, let's not break everything. No, this is dangerous. No, no more. No, I will not lose my license for you. I will not be disbarred to enrich you. No, I will not compromise my values for your short-term gain. No, because I am a technologist. In my profession, I take pride. To it, I owe solemn obligations. Margaret Hamilton once said, I began to use the term software engineer to distinguish it from hardware and other kinds of engineering. When I first started using the phrase, it was considered to be quite amusing. It was an ongoing joke for a long time. They liked to kid me about my radical ideas. Software eventually necessarily gained the same respect as any other discipline. By emulating engineering, a field that had already undergone professionalization, Hamilton was nobly setting a path for a vision of tech where we recognize there are real stakes for failure. With the last 50 years as a cautionary tale, let's reintroduce the discipline of engineering to the current free-for-all that is software development. It's time for tech workers to professionalize and reclaim their craft from those whose only goal is to get rich, to have more. And I sincerely hope they do. Because while we wait for physical reality to return, what tech workers are building is quite literally all we have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shimana, for that very powerful and thought-provoking talk. I know I personally learned quite a lot from it and I'm sure it's going to resonate with a lot of our audience members as well. So I can see a lot of questions coming through in the chat window, but I might start with a bit of definitions to ask you to clarify some terms that I thought were quite interesting and we need to sort of propel to the fore. Um, you mentioned the term social technology and social engineering. Um, can you please uh, provide us with a bit of a definition as to how you exactly define those two terms? Yes, um, of course. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to clarify, Ruba. Um, when I say social technology, I mean the data intensive, data extractive technology that powers big tech. Tech that is ostensibly designed to facilitate smart society, but which depends entirely on harvesting and analyzing and monetizing our personal information and directing our thoughts, feelings, and behavior. Um, so if it powers surveillance capitalism as a business model, it's almost certainly the kind of technology I have in mind. Um, as for social engineering, I don't, I'm not using the term in the information security sense of the word, um, but in the sense that Lanier uses it. Uh, the deliberate engineering of how society itself functions. Social en engineering in that context is a man manipulation technique that exploits human vulnerabilities in order to regulate the development and behavior of people in society. That That's perfect. Thank you for that clarity. Um, I think it's really important that we set the basis for, for this discussion with these uh, really important definitions. Um, now, Jumana, your talk highlighted many, many important concepts, but I think two that we'd love to elaborate on are these notions of control and accountability. Uh, can you please expand uh, as to your position in relation to technology and control and also the significance of accountability? Absolutely. So I think that with technology currently, control and accountability are inversely proportional. The reality is that the vast ever expanding near absolute control over technology is in the hands of a few people, mostly male, mostly white, all financially comfortable to staggeringly wealthy. At the same time, too much of the conversation we have today on accountability is about the responsible use of technology by users, which effectively means that kids, parents, regular folks, the world, across the world are being held accountable for the impact that technology has on their lives. I think the scales need to be rebalanced. Those who control the technology, those who unleash it on the world must be held accountable for the harm it causes just as they are lauded for the benefits it presents. Wow, I have so many follow-up questions, Jumana. I'm conscious in the interest of time to get sort of a wide range of, uh, of concepts discussed. And then I'm sure there'd be many more questions in our live session also. So the next question I have for you is 
quite a loaded one and quite a big one, as are all of my questions today. Um, so I found your discussions surrounding the choices and assumptions that technologists make really fascinating, particularly when you spoke about digital building blocks. Um, so you mentioned that term digital building blocks, and I think it's quite fascinating. So in particular, you make a very valid observation and something that resonated with me was your discussion about in considering and designing the digital, we must not neglect the very real consequences. And you use that, that those terms, or those two words, very real consequences showing sort of the, you know, the bridge between the virtual and the physical as well, which I think we need to address. So um, how do you suggest we go about addressing those gap between this digital space, those digital building blocks, and also the very real world in which we operate in and live in? Yeah, right. love good question. <laughs> No, it's a great question. Thank you. I mean, look, the reality is that today we depend on digital infrastructure to live our very physical lives. I mean, digital technology is how we learn, how we communicate, how we connect, how medicine is practiced, how businesses are run, how our children are educated. It's how our governments exercise their power. The digital world is not a different world. It's a very powerful tool in this one, the one we all live in. And in this very real world, professionalization is my shorthand for building the same safeguards and culture that exists for any high stakes enterprise where we've decided the cost of runaway hobbyism is too high. Medicine, engineering, architecture, and yeah, social technology. Because we know without a shadow of a doubt that social data-driven data-intensive technology can cause very real harm to individuals, to children, and to whole communities. And in my view, professionalization is a way to make the connection for technologists between the data, the abstract ones and zeros, the code they create and deploy, and the very real people on whom they unleash it, the flesh and blood people who will be impacted by it. Very wise. That does answer my question. Thank you. Some very wise words. And I just think about it uh, in terms of uh, as a technologist, as someone who's working in the socio-technical space, the very real value of considering things from this perspective and building it into our design processes, uh, working on how we can actually operationalize these, uh, these really important concepts and, and, and notions and ideas that you're speaking of. So thank you for sharing that, Shumana. Um, you, I think this is a really good point to pick up on the concept of professionalization and professionalizing social technology as you framed it. So you spoke about the opportunities of professionalization. Can you please talk a bit more about the benefits and also some of the challenges that we might encounter if we were to engage in this endeavor? Yeah, I mean, the professional, the benefits of professionalization are many, um, but the most important, I think, is that we it frees us, it allows us to free ourselves of the paralysis that comes from thinking, thinking we need to solve a hundred problems when really we need to address one problem with a hundred symptoms. So we can stop playing whack-a-mole and focus on addressing the underlying issue proactively rather than piecemeal. Um, so that to me is a huge benefit. It allows us to focus our uh, collective efforts in one direction. Um, as for the biggest challenges, I see two. Uh, the first is quite frankly, simply socializing the idea. Because if you think about it, we all are familiar with doctors and lawyers, um, but we don't really think about them as oath-taking professionals who are governed by universal standards and ethics and who are surrounded by institutions that enforce those standards. Um, we just go to them. So, we have assumptions that we make about, doc, um, about um, you know, doctors and lawyers um, and don't have the context behind it. So socializing the idea of professionalization as something that is important in a field is itself a significant challenge. Um, the second challenge I see is getting buy-in from industry leader, leaders. Um, you know, change is hard. This is a generic answer, but you know, many leaders will continue to stand in the way of change that forces them to behave differently. It takes work and it can be scary. It's destabilizing, um, but it's necessary. Thank you, Jamana. I think this provides us with a lot of food for thought. Um, uh, it, 
for STEM professionals and even beyond the STEM domain as to how we can actually or how we might go about professionalizing technology and what some of the obstacles and hurdles are and how we can build them into existing processes. And I see that as maybe a way to connect with industry. Um, and that's our access point in that we take established models and integrate either the idea of professionalization or any other kind of principles and, and, and ethical frameworks within the context of existing models just to provide that uh, familiar aspect. Um, I might pick up on an audience question that's related to that idea. So in the uh, in the chat window. Um, so if we don't professionalize Shimana, what do you think might happen? I mean, you did allude to that in your talk and, and quite strongly gave a, a powerful message, but what do you see as the short-term implications of not professionalizing and also the long-term implications? And if you wanted to touch on one in each category, that would be fantastic. Um, great question. Um, you know, I mean, it's interesting because uh, we are so awash in dystopian fiction and dystopian projections right now that, that I think that if anywhere you look, any paper you pick up, um, any book you could pick up, you can see sort of the disaster scenarios, the car crashes you know, the metaphorical car crashes that we have ahead of us. Um, so in the short term, I think that, uh, you know, uh, we'll have a, um, a continuing uh, power struggle um, that, that now doesn't go just from like big tech as, in, as a unit against society or justice, um, but within tech also as to, who is the who is the gatekeeper and who controls the future of tech? And uh, I see it sort of being concentrate further concentrated in the short term um, in the hands of even fewer people. So that has me worried. In the long term, if we don't professionalize, uh, I don't really want to think about that. Um, because I think it's dire. I think, I think if we don't professionalize uh, in the long term, we're gonna, you know, we're, we're gonna find ourselves, um, we're gonna find ourselves devolving rather than evolving. We're gonna find ourselves um, unable to keep up because our institutions and our cultures and our societies will be so out of touch, out of place um, with the technologies that are being developed to shape our minds and our behavior, um, that there's gonna be a complete schism. I, you know, I uh, hate to be, uh, completely negative, but you know, you, you, this is, this is how class wars happen. This is how uh, real bloody revolutions happen. There's some very powerful and important words, Shumana, that I think we really need to reflect on in, in, in everything we're doing in this space. And, and I'm glad we have the forum at this uh, symposium to do just that and to hear your thoughts and learn from you as to potentially the best path forward or, or a path forward which I think um, is encompassing and, and uh, allows us to work, work towards this notion that I'd like to shift tracks a bit here, this notion of empowerment which is what I took away towards the end of your talk. And, and I just want to leave the audience with this recording with something, um, a sense of hope, a sense of empowerment, something that we can look forward to, which I think is what you're all about and a lot of your work and what Pivot for Humanity is about, that empowerment aspect. Um, so my second last question to you, Jemana, is you concluded your talk by mentioning and alluding to the need to empower what shape and form do you see this empowerment taking? And I know Professor Michael and I are very are passionate about the idea of empowerment, but what do you see as, um, as empowerment? What shape does it take? And how do you consider this um, uh, benefiting the professionalization of technology? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, um, contrary to appearances about the doomsday scenario I laid out before, um, 
I fundamentally believe uh, that we are, you know, headed towards sunshine and sunrise and uh, a, a better world. And I think that is because um, of this empowerment that we're already seeing happening. So when I talk about empowerment, it isn't about handing over power, or allowing somebody power. It's a, it's a sense of power that is innate and that comes up. So my hope is that technologists and tech workers empower themselves that they reclaim their power, reclaim their craft. Their tech workers are far less likely to stand up for what they believe, to whistleblow or push back um, if they feel disposable, if they feel professional or financial insecurity, that's normal, none of us would. The power to say no, the power to refuse, the, the power to speak up is incredibly important, it's essential. And tech workers are powerless without it. So I'm a big fan of groups like the Tech Workers Coalition and Demand Progress and Coworker.org and Amazon Employees for Climate Justice because they work to protect workers and to ensure that they are empowered to call a lack of ethical norms when they see them. And those efforts will be a big part of any successful professionalization effort. When I talk about empowerment, I'm talking about the collective power of the craftsmen, of the sorcerers, of the technologists themselves. That was so eloquently put, Shumana. Thank you so much for that. Um, and finally, I just wanted to end on this question. So there's something that strikes me about the way you present and when I speak to you is that you so vividly paint a picture with your words. Now, I'm going to ask you to paint a picture for us of what you see our future um, as being. I'd like you to not project too far into the future, 2030. What do you see as our future? Um, well, I mean, this is the, the painting of a child, but just bear with me. I see a sandwich. <laughs> um, because I'd like to break away from sort of the, the, you know, I talked earlier about dystopia and I think that, you know, it's understandable right now that our civic imaginations are confined to, you know, identifying the, the dystopian flavor um, that is most likely to happen and then just sort of coming to terms with it, be, being okay with it. Um, but I'd like to break away from that path and suggest a different future, a future in which a combination of um, civic pressure from below and enlightened self-interest from above uh, has totally remade the social tech sector. Um, into one where every power player has institutional, legal, and social constraints placed upon them. So civic pressure from below, enlightened self-interest from above. So I can't paint every detail of how we get there, but I know that when those in power face accountability, at least commensurate to their power, to their level of control, that'll be a, an excellent sandwich. It'll be interesting, Jumana, to hear whether there's appetite for that sandwich, but I'm sure we'll find out more at ISTAS 20. I wanted to thank you so much for joining us today, uh, for giving up your time, for accepting our invitation, and for providing us with a, what I see as an industry-based practical path forward. So uh, I just wanted to signal a reminder to everyone, any of you who have questions, please let us know. This will be broadcast live. And, and, and thank you again, Shumana. Thank you, Professor Michael. I might hand over for uh, final words to our program, uh, our general chair, Professor Katina Michael. Uh, thank you so much, Roba. Um, I'm struggling to articulate anything but gratitude. We've just heard a revolutionary talk by a pioneer in this space. I think uh, there are lots of messages there for IEEE SSIT, the Society on the Social Implications of Technology. I think there are a lot of messages there for New America and the number of foundations supporting New America. I think we have found the voice to give us part of the solution and the way forward. Um, what I appreciated, uh, Jimana, were your declarations and your denouncements of what individual workers will not tolerate. It's almost equivalent to uh, an analogy of a, 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 almost a, a baptism of fire. And here is really our final frontier when we become employees, we don't forget that we're actually human and we're people. 
and those denouncements are converted into my heart, I denounce fraud, I denounce unethical behavior, I denounce persecution of peoples, I denounce violence, I denounce wrongdoing and corruption, I denounce people who use workers in the wrong way, I denounce the powerful against those who are weak and vulnerable. And so I take away this message of hope that you have given us strength and a way forward to professionalize. And as we know, our ethics and our paperwork is not working in terms of codes of conduct. We've seen that through research and you're basically talking about being human and we can't forget to be human. So your message, I hope will be reverberated across the web. I thank uh, Dr. Roba Abbas as well for her excellent program chairing throughout the conference uh, that ASU is hosting, but also that we get this message as far and wide. So for people listening, please share the right messages as uh, portrayed and presented in this presentation. Thank you, Jemana, for your time and Roba. Thank you so much for this fresh young voice that has to be heard in this space of technology, business, uh, engineering, law and society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.